بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا ومولانا محمد النبي الامي وعلى اله وسلم تسليما رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي Imran ibn Hussain radiyallahu ta'ala anhu was from the tribe of Banu Khuzara. If you look in your maps in the back, you'll see Banu Khuzara is located between Medina Munawwara and Makkah Mukarramah. This tribe is very poor, important to understand a very important event in the history or in the seat of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that is the conquest of Makkah Mukarramah. Banu Khuzara played a vital role in the conquest of Makkah Makarama, they were a cause behind it. And inshallah, we'll talk about that a little bit later, inshallah. Since it relates to the background of Imran ibn Hussain radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Imran ibn Hussain radiallahu ta'ala anhu was very similar to Wail ibn Hujar radiallahu ta'ala anhu in that he never migrated to Medina Munawwara. He accepted Islam and he accepted Islam in the very beginning. So he's considered amongst the Sabiqun, those who accepted Islam in the very beginning. And the tribe of Banu Khuzara was located not too far from Makkah Mukarramah. So during the early days, he would stay in Makkah Mukarramah to be in the company of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to sit in his gatherings. His father also later accepted Islam and the story of his father's accepting Islam is very touching. And inshallah we'll go over that. But before we go into a little detail, I just want to go over some brief um, overview of Imran ibn Hussain radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So as I mentioned, he was from the tribe of Banu Khuzara. And he never migrated to Medina Munawwara after the migration. But what he would do is he visited Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a lot. So he often traveled back and forth between his tribe and uh, Medina Munawwara often was going back and forth and he has narrated a lot of hadith and I saw a strange similarity between Wail ibn Hujar and Imran ibn Hussein in that both of them never migrated from their hometowns but both of them have narrated a lot of ahadith they never settled down in Medina Munawwara, so they didn't get a lot of time to spend with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But the time that they were there, they were sitting in all the gatherings and listening to all the ahadith and going on to narrate those ahadith to others. Imran ibn Hussain radiallahu anhu, Wail ibn Hujr, both have narrated many, many ahadith. In comparison to many of the Sahaba who did migrate, if they were not originally from Medina Munawwara, and did not narrate very many hadith, which is strange. In regards to description given about Imran ibn Hussain radiallahu ta'ala anhu, there's a few things that we know. Number one, that he had a ring that he used to wear because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to wear a ring. So he also wore a ring. And just for our knowledge, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he wore a ring, he would wear it on his right and his left. Only one ring, never more than one ring. And if he wore on his right, he would wear either on his pinky or his ring finger. Similarly on the left, if he was wearing on his left, he would wear it on the pinky or on the ring finger. It was, it's makru or impermissible because it's resemblance with the woman to wear it on the middle finger on the, what is this one? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, the index finger, so which one is? Okay, so the index finger, the middle finger, and the thumb. For a woman it's okay, but for men it's not. So he had this, uh, thing, uh, he had this ring that had a little, it said that there was a little man on it without a face, and he had a sword strapped to his chest. And that was what was um, engraved on his ring, which he would wear all the time. Also, once he wore a cloth called khuzzin. It's like, uh, sorry, khuzzin. It's not uh, silk, but it's like silk. And it's, it's very expensive. 
And he wore it once, and then he narrated a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Silk is haram for men, so this was not silk. So once he came out wearing this cloth, and the person narrating the hadith says, I only saw him wearing this once in his life. I never saw him wearing it before this. I never saw him wearing it after this. When he came out of his house wearing this, he narrated the hadith explaining why he was wearing it. He said, Inna Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Ida an'ama ala abdihi ni'matan Yuhibbu an yara athara ni'mati ala abdihi That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses his servant with a blessing, he likes to see that blessing on him. So if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you something, wealth, use it. It's not, no harm in wearing nice clothes as long as the clothes are not being worn for show, which is haram, to show people that you're something. But you're wearing it for, if you're wearing it with the intention that I want to express my shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he has given me this blessing, it actually is rewarding from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So just to fulfill this hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he wore that. Which means generally speaking, he wore very simple clothes throughout his whole life. Very simple clothes. Another thing we know about him is once Hilal ibn Yasaf, one of the tabi'een, he said, I came into the masjid, فَإِذَا أَنَا بِشَيْخٍ أَبْيَضِ الرَّأْسِ I came upon an old man, أَبْيَضِ الرَّأْسِ All the hair on his head was white, وَالْلِحْيَةِ And his beard was all white as well. مُسْتَنِدٍ إِلَىٰ أُسْتَوَانَةٍ فِي حَلْقَةٍ يُحَدِّثُهُمْ And he was leaning against a pillar in the masjid and there was a circle of people around him and he was narrating the hadith of Rasulullah وسلم to them. I asked Someone, man hadha, who is this? And they said, this is Imran ibn Hussein. We learn from this that Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu, unlike other sahaba that we have heard about in the shining stars list, did used to use khidab or some form of dye to color their beard or to color the hair on their head. But Imran ibn Hussein didn't. He used to keep his hair white and never dyed his hair with henna or khidab or waras or za'faran like we have read about Jirid ibn Abdullah al-Bajali, and we'll read about other Sahaba as well. Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu, after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa passed away, stayed in his tribe, he was one of the bigger narrators of hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so he was blessed with a lot of knowledge. A lot of knowledge. During the Khilafah of Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn Khattab, Many new cities sprang up in the east because the Muslim armies were fighting on that side, on that front, on the Persian side in the east, and they couldn't come back to Medina Munawwara for reinforcement. So Amir al Mu'minin Ibn al Khattab established new cities. One of the cities was Kufa, and another city was Basra. And it said in the narrations, in the historical narrations, that Umar ibn Khattab even established the blueprint of Kufa and Basra, what it would look like. The, the, how big the houses will be, where the masjid will be, and how la, la, uh, wide the pathways would be that would be running between the ho- houses and to the masjid. After Kufa and Basra were made and built, he was worried about people... Uh, scholars going there and teaching the people, imparting them the knowledge of the deen. A lot of people settled down in Kufa. People from the armies that were fighting on that side, they all settled down in Kufa. And many tribes from the Arabian Peninsula moved to Kufa and Basra. So Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu ta'ala who sent many sahaba to both Kufa and to Basra, who settled down there, lived there their whole lives, and also passed away there. So many of the graves of our sahaba are actually in Kufa and in Basra. And we have mentioned one or two of them in, 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 the, uh, in the Shining Stars before. Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu anh, is one of the Sahaba who Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent to Basra. 
so that he could teach them the knowledge of the deen and explain the knowledge of the deen to them. So Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu ta'ala who made Basra his hometown, he left his own city, left the whole Arabian Peninsula for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this was the way of the Sahaba. This was the way of the Sahaba. They would sacrifice everything, their lives, their families, where they lived, their, their homes, everything for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The order came and they would leave. So there was over 1500 Sahaba living in Kufa. After, during the time of Amir al-Mu'mineen, many of them passed away there. Abdullah bin Masood was one of the famous Sahaba from Kufa. He passed away in Medina Munawwara, came at the end of his life to Medina Munawwara, passed away there. He's buried in Jannah al-Baqi, we'll talk about him. In the end, he's one of the last of our shining stars. And Hussein, Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu anh, also went to Basra, left everything behind, and he settled down there, and he lived there his whole life. There's many things mentioned about him by some of the great scholars of Basra. One of them is Ibn Sirin. You may have heard his name, Ibn Sirin. Who was Ibn Sirin? Ibn Sirin was the scholar who was considered the master interpreter of dreams. Master interpreter of dreams. Everyone, including Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, all of them, if they ever saw a dream, they would send Imam Malik from Medina Munawwara, Imam Abu Hanifa from Kufa would send a person to go all the way to Basra, to Imam Alam ibn Sirin, to ask him about the interpretation of a dream. This is how good he was. And his book, Ta'abir Ru'ya, is very famous. Ibn Sirin, rahimullah, says about Imran ibn Hussein, he says, مَا قَدِمَ الْبَصَرَةَ أَحَدٌ مِّنْ أَسْحَابِ النَّبِي صلى الله عليه وسلم يَفْضُلُ عَلَىٰ Imran ibn Hussein there is not any single person from amongst the Sahaba of Rasulullah who descended upon Basra who was greater and higher ranking and more elevated than Imran ibn Hussain This tells us two things. Number one, that there were many Sahaba that settled down in Basra under the order uh, of Amir al-Mu'mineen Umar ibn Khattab. And number two, that Imran ibn Hussain of all of those Sahaba was the greatest Sahabi in Basra. This is a uh, testimony and a statement made by Alam ibn Sirin, who was one of the top scholars. So him saying this is, is sufficient proof of Imran ibn Hussain position amongst all the Sahaba in Basra. Also, Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah used to say, Hassan Basri, who's Hassan Basri? Our, spirit, our spiritual order, the Chishtiya, and even the Shaziliya, go all the way back to Hassan Basri, then from Hassan Basri to Ali, and from Ali radiallahu anhu to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Hassan Basri is considered the Imam of the Sufiya. He was also a muhaddith and also a faqih. He says, Yahlifu, he used to swear by Allah, Annahu ma qadim al basrata wa sirwa khayrul lahum min Imran. There's nobody who came to Basra or serve better than Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu ta'ala an. So these are two great scholars, Jiris, interpreter of dream, who have bear, bore witness that no one was greater than Imran ibn Hussein in Basra. Now we will talk about, very briefly, but quickly, since it does relate to the life of Imran ibn Hussein, and attest to the fact that he accepted Islam in the very beginning, as I mentioned. He was one of the Sabiqun, but his father was not Muslim um, when Imran ibn Hussein accepted Islam. He accepted Islam after him, and he is also considered amongst the earlier Sahaba, but he accepted Islam after. Unlike the Sahabi who we talked about yesterday, Bashir ibn Aqrab al Joni, he was yet a child, his father accepted Islam, then he accepted Islam. And usually in most cases of Sahaba, in which the father and the son were both Muslim, usually it was the father accepted Islam first and the son afterwards. Imran ibn Hussein, the situation was completely the opposite. His father, obviously his name, if his name was Imran ibn Hussein, his father's name was Hussein. He was one of the chiefs of his tribe and the people of Makkah, the Quraysh, respected him a lot. They respected Hussein a lot because he was a very influential chief and very well known in, the, in, in Quraysh, in Makkah Mukarramah and in that region of Tahama. So it's mentioned that when he came to do tawaf in Makkah Mukarramah once, Quraysh came to him and they 
talk to him about, you know, there's this new person come out, his name is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's amongst our Ahl Bayt, and he's really causing a lot of trouble, and you have a lot of influence, maybe you can talk him into, uh, stop his, you know, uh, stop propagating his message amongst the people. And maybe he'll listen to you because of your status and because of your position amongst the Arabs. Which means that Rasulullah also knew Hussein very well, his position, his status. So Hussein came to Dar Arqam, the house of Arqam where the Sahaba would gather. So we know that this is the very earlier times in Makkah Makarma, and there's only about 30, 40 Sahaba, and among them is the son Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Actually, radiallahu ta'ala anhu ma. Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu came to the door, and Quraysh followed him. He went in, and there were Sahaba sitting inside the gathering, among them his son. The Quraysh sat outside in the hope that maybe he'll bring some change to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So they were waiting in hope outside the door, listening to the whole conversation. So when he came in, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, O Si'ul al-Shaykh, make space for the Shaykh, he's coming in. Then, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa made space for him. Hussein came and sat down next to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Hussein started the conversation. He says, what is this that we've been hearing about you? That you swear and curse our gods and our idols. And you talk badly about them and criticize them. Even though your father, وَقَدْ كَانَ أَبُوكَ حَسِينَةً وَخَيْرًا Your father was a very pure person, well protected, guarded, and a person of khair, a person of good. Now who are you? Your father is such a great person and you've come down so low and you're talking about these type of things. You should be at the status of your father. Uphold his name. So he says, Ya Hussein. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, Ya Hussein. Inna abi wa abaka fin nar. My father and your father are in the hellfire. Don't talk to me about the fathers. Your father and my father are in the hellfire. And then he said, Ya Hussein, Kam ta'abudu min ilah. How many gods do you worship? He said, Wahidun fi sama wa sab'atun fi ard. One in the sky and seven in the earth. See, because the Arabs believed in Allah. But their problem was that they made partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Okay, Hussein, فَإِذَا أَسَابَكَ الضُّرْمًا تَدْعُوا When any harm or difficulty comes upon you, who do you call? He says, Muhammad, we always call only the one in the sky. إِلَاهٌ فِي السَّمَاءِ He says, فَيَسْتَجِيبُوا لَكُمْ وَتُشْرِكَهُمْ بِهِ That you, he accepts your call and he removes the harm away from you and then you still make partners with him? Allahu Akbar. What is wrong with you, Hussein? That's just like the example that you have a father who's always been there for you as a father and then you go out to somebody else and say, Oh my father, why are you making other people partner with your father? Likewise, Rasulullah sallallahu wa sallam is saying, why are you making other people partners with Allah when He's the one who's there for you at all times and He's the one when you call out to Him who always answers your calls? Doesn't make any sense, Hussein. So he says, أَرَضِيتَهُ فِي الشُّكْرِ Is it that you've made a contract with Allah that you've pleased Him that okay, you know, Ya Allah, we're going to uh, worship other partners with you if it's okay with you. So Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu says, he says, La, no, no, no. That's not the case. So then he kept on talking, Rasulullah kept on giving him nasiha. 
explaining to him logically that, you know, this doesn't make sense. Why are you making partners? And he said such things that kind of reminds me when we call people towards Islam, Christians, Jews, and others, they often say, you know, you're saying such things. I've never heard any person talk like this before. I've heard so many people when we talk to them about Islam, they say, you know, that makes sense. I, nobody's ever talked to me like this before. He said the exact same thing. He said, he mentioned such things to me that nobody's ever talked to me like this before. So he said, Ya Hussein, now that you've understood that this is the truth, Aslim Taslam. Accept Islam, you will be saved from the hellfire. He said, Ya Muhammad, Inna li qawman wa ashiratan. I have a nation, a tribe behind me. I'm the chief of that tribe and I have a family. What am I supposed to do? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Read this dua. This is a dua. For people who convert to Islam, they have families behind them who are non-Muslim. Beautiful dua. And this is also a dua for when you're facing a difficult situation and you don't know how to proceed in the matter, use this dua. Allahumma astahdika li arshadi amri wa zidni ilman yanfa'uni. Oh Allah, guide me li arshadi amri. On the safest and the best route for me to take in this matter. And Allah will guide you. And bless me with a knowledge that can benefit me, that I could use in this situation to help me resolve my issue. So he read this, and through this, Hussein radiallahu ta'ala an, whose heart opened up, he accepted Islam. And when I talk about the tribe of Banu Khuza'a, you'll see how this dua was fulfilled. And when he went back, how his people softened to Islam. Even though they didn't become Muslim right away, but they softened up to Islam. So he became Muslim. And after he accepted Islam, he got up to leave. And Rasulullah told the Sahaba, make space for him. When he had first come in, in the state of Kufr, Imran ibn Hussein was sitting in the crowd, his son. When he got up to leave as a Muslim, Imran ibn Hussein came up to his father in front of Rasulullah He kissed his forehead, he kissed his cheeks, he kissed his hands, and he kissed his feet. And Rasulullah was watching this and he started crying. And the Sahaba looked at Rasulullah and asked him, why is he crying? He said, Bakaytu min sani'i Imran ibn Hussein. I am crying over this action of Imran ibn Hussein. That dakhala Hussein wa huwa kafir. That when he came in in the state of kufr, his son never stood up for him. But now he has accepted Islam. Imran ibn Hussein has kissed his forehead, he's kissed his cheeks, his hands, and he's kissed his feet. What he meant to say was, that look at the love of Imran ibn Hussein for the deen of Allah. That he loves the deen of Allah more than he loves his own father. That when his father came in the state of kufr, he never stood up. But when he left a Muslim, he kissed him and respected him so much. This is Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Now, I'll briefly go over, very briefly, about the event of the conquest of Makkah and the part that Banu Khuza'a played in it. So we understand the effect of this dua that, Imran, that Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu made. If you remember, there was the Treaty of Hudaybiyah that took place. The Treaty of Hudaybiyah between Quraysh and the Muslimin. This treaty was very one-sided against the Muslimin. There was many conditions in that treaty. One of the condition was that any ally of Quraysh or the Muslimin, if they fight against each other, the Quraysh will not side with their ally and the Muslimin will not side, side with their ally. Giving them equipment or sending some people to fight on that side, they will not participate in anything. will have nothing to do with it. 
the tribe of Banu Bakr was an ally of Quraysh and the tribe of Banu Khuza'a, this tribe of Imran ibn Hussein allied themselves with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Muslimin. And Banu Bakr and Banu Khuza'a did not get along. They had been enemies from the time of Jahiliyyah. One night after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, Banu Bakr attacked the tribe of Banu Khuza, the tribe of Imran ibn Hussein, and they killed one person. And also, when they tried to come to the haram, the, sanct the place of sanctity, according to the Arabs, when you arrive in the haram, nobody can touch you. Some of the people from the tribe of Banu Khaza'a held on to the ghulaf, the cloth of Kaaba, to seek protection from it against Banu Bakr. But Banu Bakr still killed them in the haram. And since it was the darkness of the night, Quraysh thought nobody would find out. They sent a couple of their men to help the tribe of Banu Bakr. To help the tribe of Banu Bakr. And even gave them some equipment. Somehow though, word got around and Rasulullah found out that the tribe of Banu Bakr has gained support from Quraysh. And Rasulullah was extremely angry. So angry that when Abu Sufyan came and he, had not, he was not there in Makkah Mukarramah at that time when this whole incident happened. But when he came back from Sham, he was on a business trip. When he came back and he found out, he was very fearful. The tribe of Quraysh, they realized that they made a mistake. They said, Abu Sufyan, go to Medina uh, Munawwara and talk to Muhammad Rasulullah about lengthening the duration of the treaty. Maybe he will lengthen the duration. Maybe he hasn't found out about it. He went and he saw that Rasulullah was ignoring him completely. Now he was desperate. He knew that this meant that now Muhammad Rasulullah is going to do something drastic against Quraysh. He did not, would not know what it was going to be, but he knew they're going to, he's going to do something. He was very fearful. So then he went to Abu Bakr Siddiq and he said, please, I ask you for help. Do something. Abu Bakr said, I can't do anything. If Rasulullah has made his decision to ignore you, that means he's made his decision to do something against you. I can't do anything. I will only give you as much protection as Muhammad Rasulullah has given you. He went to Umar ibn Khattab. He gave the same response. Went to uh, Uthman Radiyan, gave the same response. Went to Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, I can't do anything for you either. He said, Ali, tell me something. Do something. Before this, he went to Fatima Radiyan. After he went to Ali Radiyan, he went to Fatima Radiyan. And he said, Oh daughter of Muhammad Rasulullah, I know he listens to you when you speak. Please do something. He says, I can't do anything. So little Hassan Radiyan was sitting there playing. He said, Tell him to give me protection and Quraysh protection. He was that desperate. She said, Ya Abu Sufyan, he's a little child. A child cannot give protection. So he came running back to Ali radiallahu ta'ala. He said, Ali, nothing is working. Do something. He says, I can't do anything for you, but you can do one thing. Maybe it might help you. Go to the masjid and make an announcement. That I give protection to the, the Muslimin and I, decide, I have decided to lengthen the duration of the treaty. Something of that sort. To show that you want to continue the treaty of Hudaybiyah. He said, will it be of any help? He said, I don't think so. I don't think so, but you should still go. When he came back, he, was, he, he went to the masjid, made the announcement, and he came back to Quraysh. He was on his way back when he saw the people from the tribe of Banu Khuza'a going back, which means that he just realized that Banu Khuza had informed Rasulullah that they have broken the treaty, this happened, and we saw some of the people of Quraysh, even though it was the night, that they violated and breached the treaty. 
And one of those people was this, Hussein. So Rasulullah sallallahu was that angry. And it was then that Rasulullah sallallahu called Abu Bakr Siddiq. Abu Bakr Siddiq came and he said, I want you to tell no one that we are going to go to Makkah Makarma and we are going to fight the Quraysh. Tell everyone to make preparations and get themselves ready, but don't tell anybody where we're going. They might think we're attacking, attacking Banu Hawazin or Banu, or one of the, Banu Thaqif or one of the other tribes out around it. But in reality, we're going to attack Quraysh. And this was a decisive moment in the history of Islam. Why? Because all the Arabs in the Arabian Peninsula were waiting for what would happen to Makkah Mukarramah. If it stayed in the hand of Quraysh, then they would be, remain kafir. And if it came in the hands of Muhammad Rasulullah they would accept Islam because they knew that this city was a holy city that was protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. They remembered many, many years ago the incident of the elephant. When the elephants came down from Yemen to attack Makkah Makarma and destroy Kaaba, how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected it. So they had a lot of veneration for the holy city of Makkah Makarma. So they had decided whoever is in control of Makkah Makarma, we will follow their belief. Once Rasulullah took over Makkah Mukarramah, after that delegations upon delegations started coming to Medina Munawwara to accept Islam. Everyone was just waiting for the conquest of Makkah Mukarramah. So this was a very decisive moment, but of course we see that it relates directly to the tribe of Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu. The tribe of Banu Khuza'ah. Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu had one, one very special quality. One very special quality. And that was the angels would speak with him and give him salam. And whenever they gave him salam, they gave it to him on his right and on his left. Never at his head. So he would hear the salam. He would hear the salam from his right side and from his left side and from his foot but he would never hear the salam from his head. And to the extent that some narrations even say that they would come and shake hands with him. Shake hands with Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu ta'ala. Nobody knew about this except one person. Mutarrif ibn Abdullah ibn Shakhir, one of the elders of Basra. He's the only one who knew. Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu ta'ala would tell him. And he would tell him that don't tell anyone this for as long as I'm alive. After I die, you can go and tell anybody you want, or if you don't want to tell anybody, that's up to you. But while I'm alive, nobody's allowed to know. So he's the main narrator of these hadith about this. About the special quality that Imran ibn Hussain radiallahu ta'ala anhu was given. Imran ibn Hussain radiallahu ta'ala had a sickness in his stomach, some type of disease that he had for 30 years. 30 years he had this disease. And he had tried every type of treatment to cure it. Nothing worked. Finally, he used the last resort that Arabs would use as a treatment. If you remember, when we were talking about Ukasha bin Mihsan radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that he is one of the people to enter paradise. And the Sahaba asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Ya Rasulullah, who are those people, 70,000 who are going to enter the paradise amongst, amongst whom was Ukasha bin Mihsan? He said, La yaktawoon, those people who don't do, who don't do cauterization, cautery. In other words, using that rod or something caustic to remove abnormal tissue or damaged tissue on their bodies. So Rasulullah sallallahu in many hadiths, if you open Kitab al-Tib in the chapters of hadith books, you'll see that Rasulullah has specifically prohibited it, that you shouldn't use that. Because sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. For the Sahaba, this was a specific instruction because of their level. Not that it was impermissible, it was haram, but because they were at the highest level of taqwa. And he did not want their, their level of tawakkul on Allah to decrease. So he told them, you don't use this. 
Imran ibn Hussein had been suffering from this disease for 30 years. And it was such a disease that it's mentioned in the riwayat that people would come to him and say that we don't like to visit you because we see you in so much pain. One such tabi'i came to visit him once and he said, Ya Aba Nujayd. This was his agnomen, Aba Nujayd. His son's name was Nujayd. Wallahi, la yamna'uni kathiran min ayadatik ma'arabik. The only thing that stops me from coming to visit you so much is when I see you in this pain. You're in so much pain all the time. He says, Ya Akhi. He says, My brother, La tuhbas. Don't stop yourself from coming to me. Wallahi. Inna ahabba dhaka ilayya ahabbu ilallah. The most beloved thing to me is the thing that's most beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, if this is most beloved to Allah and He's kept me in this condition, then this is most beloved in the eyes of myself as well. If this is what Allah loves for me, this is what I love for myself. Nothing should stop you from coming to me. Come and visit me. Don't think that I'm distressed and I'm displeased with my condition. Allah loves me in this condition. I love myself in this condition. This was their state of complete tawakkul on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Two years before he passed away. Two years. He was given advice. Why don't you just do the iktiwa? Kawa, use it. Maybe it might help. They convinced him. And he got it done. And the angel stopped coming. No more salam. No more shaking of hands. They stopped coming completely. And then he realized. And remembered the hadith of Rasulullah I remember myself narrating the hadith in which Rasulullah specifically told us, don't do kawa. And he says, مَا أَفْلَحْنَا وَمَا أَنْجَحْنَا مُنذُ إِكْتَوَيْنَا أَفْلَحْنَا from the word فَلَا حَيَّا عَلَى الْفَلَاحِ وَمَا أَنْجَحْنَا نَجَاحِ Both mean success. But فَلَاحْ refers to success in the akhirah and نَجَاحْ refers to success in the dunya. So he's saying that I have not gained success in this dunya because I did not, I was not cured from my sickness and I have not been successful in terms of the akhirah because I went against the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. مَا أَفْلَحْنَا وَمَا أَنْجَحْنَا مُنذُ إِكْتَوَيْنَا So once, he called Mutarraf ibn Abdullah Shakhir, ibn Shakhir, rahimahullah. After the effect of that treatment that he got done was gone, he had himself burned. Cauterization involves burning. So when the effect of that burning was gone, the angels came back. So he mentions, he called Mutarraf, it's mentioned in the narration that he called Mutarraf ibn Shakhir. And he said, Alhamdulillah, today, those who used to come to me and visit me often, they came to me today and said, Salam to me. So Mutarraf ibn Shakhir, he asked a question. Ibn Abdullah ibn Shakhir, he asked a question. Min aina yusallimu alayk? From where did they give you the salam? And he said, Asma'u at taslima an yamini wa an yasar. I heard the salam from the right and from the left. Mutarraf ibn Abdullah ibn Shakhir was a great scholar and one of the great Sufiya. He said, I said to him, if they said salam to you from the head, that's a sign of your death. Mutarraf ibn Abdullah ibn Shakhir narrates that the next day, he called me again and he said they visited me again, but this time they said salam to me from my head. This is the first time in 30 years that my salam has been given to me from the head, from the head side. So Mutarraf ibn Abdullah ibn Shakhir was scared. He said, why did I say what I said? He said, Qultu That was just my opinion. I, it was just my opinion that, you know, if it's from the head, that probably means. But I don't think that's what it really means. In his mind, he was scared now that this is true. And indeed, that's exactly what happened. Two days later, 
Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu ta'ala who passed away. So this is a one very special quality that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu with. There was one very difficult time that came upon the Sahaba. Very difficult time that came upon the Sahaba. I want you to think of a situation yourself. Your mother and your father, you love both of them dearly. They get into a fight. They get into a fight and very severe. And they come to you asking for help that help us decide who's right and who's wrong. What are you supposed to do? What are you supposed to do? This is what situation that the Sahaba faced. On one hand, they had Ali. They had heard the hadith about his great status. And on the other hand, they had Amir Muawiyah They had heard about his status in the eyes of, uh, from Rasulullah Sallallahu as well. So when the issue came, when they were, there was a war going on between them, the Sahaba did not know what to do. It was a very difficult situation. And for them, it was a matter of Jannah and Jahannam. If I go on this side and he's right, I go to Jahannam. So most Sahaba took the route that Imran ibn Hussein took. They decided not to get involved in anything. But like many Sahaba who did not get involved and just stayed out of the whole situation, Imran ibn Hussein was very, act, very active in, in encouraging people to stay out of it. Just stay out of it. One of the reasons he never used to especially get involved in this was because of a very special hadith that he heard about Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He said, once he was looking at Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, before I narrate the hadith, once he was looking at Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu very carefully. And he kept on looking and looking and looking until Ali radiallahu ta'ala started feeling uncomfortable. Staring at me for. So Ali radiallahu ta'ala said to him, Ya Imran, why you keep on staring at me? He said, Sami'atu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yaqool Anadhar ila aliyyan ibadah To look at Ali is a form of ibadah Is a form of worship So I just keep on looking at you I'm sorry I have to, it's a form of ibadah, I'm getting rewards Now you can imagine when he's heard this hadith Why he would not want to fight against Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. On the other hand, there's many hadith from him about Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala anhu as well. It was a very difficult situation. So he did not participate on either side. Once, right before the battle of Jamal, this was the battle that took place between three Sahabi on one side and one Sahabi on the other. Ali radiallahu on one side, and the mother of the believers, Aisha Siddiqah radiallahu ta'ala anha on the other, Zubair ibn Awam radiallahu ta'ala one of the Ashara Mubashra, the ten who's promised Jannah, and another one, Talha bin Ubaidullah, also one of the ten promised Jannah. They had convinced a tribe called Banu Adi two days before the battle of Jamal, and the battle of Jamal happened very close to Basra. So they had convinced people from the tribe of Banu Adi who were living in Basra to join them and fight on the side of Aisha Siddiqah radiallahu ta'ala anha. Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu ta'ala sent a person to go to the masjid after the salah and to stand up and make an announcement. What was that announcement? He said, go to the masjid, make the announcement. The Imran ibn Hussein, the Sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Yahlifu billah, swears by Allah, Alladhi la ilaha illahu, there is no God but Allah, لأن يكون عبدا حبشيا مجدعا يرعى أعنزا حضنيات في رأس جيل, 
في رأس الجبل سوري حتى يدركه الموت أحب إليه من أن يرمي في أحد من الفريقين بسهم أخطأ أو أصابه. He swears by the one that there's no deity beside him that if you follow a slave, a black slave that is grazing sheep on the summit of a mountain you stay with him is better for you than you throw an arrow on either side whether it hits or whether it misses. فَأَمْسِكُوا Hold yourselves back. Do not fight. فِدًا لَكَ لَكُمْ أَبِي وَأُمِّي Look at how many different forms of emphasis he's giving. May my father and my mother be ransomed for you. Do not do this. Do not fight on the side of Ummul Mu'mineen. Do not fight on the side of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Do not get involved in this at all. So the person who said this, the tribe of Banu Adi, they stood up and said, get out of here. Da'ana minka ayyul khulam. Get out of here. فَإِنَّا وَاللَّهِ لَا نَدْعُوا ثُفْلَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ We will never leave the wife of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم alone. It's mentioned that the next day, two days later, when the battle of Jamal took place, 10 to 15,000 people were shaheed. Of them, 70 of them were those who hold, held a very high status. They're among those who were collectors of the Qur'an Hakim during the time of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. They were all sahaba, all shaheed, all martyred in the battle against between Muslims. So Imran ibn Hussain radiallahu ta'ala anhu, this was what he was worried about. This happened. Once Abi Qatada radiallahu ta'ala anhu, rahimahullah, came up to him and asked him, Imran, this is the time of fitna, what should I do? He said, Ilzam masjidak. Stay in the masjid. Don't go anywhere. What if people come to the masjid and cause fitna? He said, Ilzam baytak. Stay in your home. Fa'indukhila ali. What if they come in my home? He said, Lo dukhila aliyya rajulun yuridu nafsi umali. If somebody comes in my home to attack me, my wealth, or my family, I think I would kill him. But, it's best that you hold on to staying in your home. Don't go out. This is not the time to even, just stay in the masjid. If the masjid is source of fitna, stay in your home. Don't go anywhere. Amen. His words were so beautiful and were prophetic. Because of the, if you look at what the, what the conditions were and what happened after that, you see that he made a very beautiful statement and his advice was very good advice that he gave. He was made a judge in Basra for a short time. He was a Sahabi and then of course he was one of the Fuqaha Sahaba. So he held a very high place in Basra. So Ziyad, who was the governor or the leader in that time, the main politician, he hired, he said to Imran ibn Hussein, I want to make you a judge. He declined, he insisted, he declined, he insisted, finally said, okay. So one day, two men came to him, and one man made his witnesses, he made his claim and brought two witnesses, and Imran ibn Hussein decided in his favor, and the person who was decided against, the defendant, he said, Qadayta alayya bijurin. You made judgment against me with zulm. You have oppressed me. He said, Why do you say such a thing? I had witnesses. He said, Those witnesses were, were false witnesses. Wallahi innahu la batil. La ilaha illahu. Wallahi, your decision was batil. Who are you saying this to? Imran ibn Hussain radiallahu anhu. Sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imran ibn Hussain, his heart came out on his mouth. He got so fearful that he's saying the name of Allah. Alladhi la ilaha illa huwa innahu labatil. He jumped out of his place. He ran straight to Ziyad and he said, A'azilni al-qada, I want nothing to do with this anymore. I can't be a judge, I'm sorry. 
He said, Mahalan ya ba nujay? Take it easy. Don't make decisions that quick. He said, no. La wallahi alladhi la ilaha illa huwa la aqdi bayna rajulain ma abattullah. I swear by the one beside who there is no deity and there is no other God. I will never make a judgment between two people for as long as I worship the one Allah. There's another incident about him that they try to make him governor of Basra. Imagine he wasn't able to willing to take the, become a judge for one day. Now they're willing to they're tra- make, making him governor. He said, "No, I'm never going to become uh, a governor because I have to face all the heat, and they get all the." Heat. Coolness. What he was referring to was that all the judgments I will make and I have to face the heat on the day of judgment for all the judgments that I made that were wrong. And here, the people who I will collect zakat from and all that which is a part of the task of the responsibility of the governor, all the people like Ziyad, they will collect that zakat and spend it on themselves and they sit in peace and quiet and I have to do all the suffering in this world and the akhirah. No, no, jazakallah. You can keep your governorship to yourself. They said, you're getting, they're giving you governorship not over Basra, over Khurasan, the whole province is yours. SubhanAllah. He said, when I'm facing the enemy in battle and the letter of Ziyad comes to me, Ziyad was the governor, the main uh, Amir. He said, his letter comes to me. If I don't follow his letter, He'll cut my head off. And if I follow the letter, halaktu, I'll be destroyed in the akhirah. No. Zakallah. Keep it to yourself. Halaktu meaning that he'll ask me to make a decision or a judgment that is against the deen of Allah. I can't make that judgment. I will be forced to make it and my deen will be destroyed. I can't do that. And if I do make the, if I don't make the judgment, then he's going to cut my head off. No, I don't want to put myself in such a Catch 22, such a situation. Keep it to yourself. So Ziyad went to another Sahabi, Hakam ibn Amr al Ghifari. Hakam ibn Amr al Ghifari. And he, he accepted the governorship of Khurasan. So Imran ibn Hussein found out. He went up to him. He was a very forceful Sahabi. It's not only about himself, he's going to make sure he gives nasiha to others too, to do the right thing. So he went to Hakim ibn uh, Amr al-Ghifari, and he says to him, have you heard the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam about a situation that took place once? That situation that took place, we're going to mention it in one of the shining stars that's going to come up a little later. So I'm not going to mention the whole thing, inshallah. Now I'm not going to mention the story, I'll just mention what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said as a result of that incident that took place. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَوْ وَقَعَ فِيهَا لَدَّخَلَ النَّارَ جَمِيعًا If they had acted upon this, they both would have gone to Jahannam. لَا طَاعَةَ لِمَخْلُوقٍ فِي مَعْسِيَةِ الْخَالِقِ There is no obedience to a Amir, to a governor, in disobedience to Allah. Yes, you are supposed to follow the Amir of the Mu'mineen, but if it requires disobedience to Allah, then you don't have to follow him anymore. The place that you are at right now, you chose and accepted the governorship. Remember, tomorrow Ziyad gives you the order to disobey Allah. You have to. He tells you to disobey Allah. You'll have only one choice, to disobey Him. And if you disobey Him, you have destroyed your deen. And you've gone against this hadith of Rasulullah And if you disobey Ziyad, He's going to cut off your head. He says, do you remember this hadith? He says, I remember. He says, Allahu Akbar. I've given my nasiha. And he left. That's how he was. I've done my job. Now it's up to you. You make your choice. Once he was sent to go and collect zakat from the different tribe. So he went, collect the zakat. He came back empty-handed. Completely empty-handed. So Ziyad says to him, where's the money, the zakat? He says, I did what we used to do in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa We used to take from the rich and give to the poor. So I took the zakat from the rich and I gave it to the poor. I'm not going to come and give it to you. So he said, okay, bismillah. 
we don't need you anymore. This was how they were strong on haqq and on following the sunnah and the way of Rasulullah in every aspect of their life, not just in ibadah, in politics, in judgment, in judiciary matters, everything. There's one or two more things I want to mention, inshallah, we'll finish. He was considered a mustajab of da'wah. Any dua he made, it was immediately accepted. As we mentioned, Imran ibn Hussein was very sick. And he was in bed. He was sick for 30 years. And he was in a lot of pain. So, his son, Nujayd, who's because of which his agnomen is Abba Nujayd, his son, Nujayd, his camel ran off somewhere. When Imran ibn Hussein, radiallahu ta'ala, who found out, he cursed it. So when Nujayd found out that my father has cursed the camel, and he liked that camel a lot, it was a good, a strong camel, he was reading, Inna lillahi wa inna rajun. He kept on saying under his breath, Inna lillahi wa inna rajun. Inna lillahi wa inna rajun. Inna lillahi wa inna rajun. So somebody asked him, What's wrong with you? Inna lillahi wa inna rajun. Inna lillahi wa inna rajun. He says, La'ana Abu Nujayd naqati. My father, Abu Nujayd, has cursed my camel. And now, something is going to happen to it. So I can't sit on it. Because if I sit on it, and the curse comes upon it, I'll be dead too. A few days later, the camel fell and it died. Something happened and it fell and it died. And then he told the people, see this is why I never rode on this camel anymore. There's one last thing that I want to mention about Imran ibn Hussein. This is very common to all the Sahaba. It's also mentioned about Uthman ibn Affan. He made this announcement. Very similar announcement is being made by Imran ibn Hussein. He said, very proudly, he said, from the time I made pledge with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, I have never what? Okay, one person knows. I have never what? Committed shirk. No. Since the time I have made the pledge. You see, you're the student of Sheikh Ibrahim, that's why. Since the time I have made pledge. With Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I have never touched my private part with my right hand. Uthman ibn Affan has made a similar statement about himself. Sahaba was very proud on following the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's sunnah was that for all good things and pure things, he would use his right hand. And for all impure things and impure things that had to be done, he would use his left hand. So, the Sahaba Ridwan Allah made it their practice to establish the character of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and every aspect of his character in their life. To the extent that he says that I never even touched my private part with my right hand. And remember, he was a mushrik at one time, so he may have done that his whole life until he accepted Islam. But, the Sahaba had changed their ways and their habits, everything. They gave themselves completely for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This was their love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And there's a great lesson in this for us to hold on to the character and the ways of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in every aspect of our life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us like Imran ibn Hussein radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Any shining star you follow, you will be guided. I asked some of the students, some of you here, who do you love the most of all the shining stars that we mentioned? So some of the people told me, I liked Abdullah Dhul Bijadain. One told me, I love Wail ibn Hujar. Everybody has their own likings and their own uh, opinions. So, Every single Sahabi was great. Any single one you follow, their path, he's like a guiding star, like a shining star. Inshallah, it'll take you to Jannah.
سبحان ربك رب العزه يما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين جزاكم الله خير